Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing how to determine several intervals and segments associated with an electrocardiogram. Over here on the right side of the screen, we have the three major features of a normal EKG pattern. The first one here is the P wave. The P wave, electrically speaking, represents atrial depolarization. And that leads to atrial systole, which is the mechanical event of the heart. Then we have this larger deflection, this whole thing right here is the QRS complex. Electrically speaking, it represents ventricular depolarization, and that leads to the mechanical event ventricular systole. And then this final wave right here, which is normally a little bit larger than the P wave, is the T wave. And electrically speaking, the T wave represents ventricular repolarization, and functionally or mechanically, that is ventricular diastole. Now, atrial repolarization is here. It's just masked by the large QRS complex. So it's approximately right here, and we just can't see it because it's covered up by this very large set of deflections, the QRS complex. But then also we have these intervals and segments that are associated with a normal EKG. Now this picture I just found on Wikipedia, but it's one of the best pictures I've ever seen on this. Very short and to the point and very accurate uh, with how it demarcates the various intervals and segments. Some of these, their names don't really make a lot of sense. You just kind of have to memorize them. There's no real good way with that. The first of these in orange is the PR interval. The PR interval starts at the initiation of the P wave, so where the P wave initially starts to rise up. And then it goes all the way to uh, the initial QRS deflection. So with the QRS complex, when we first eyeball it on an EKG, what everyone always sees is the R. The R is this giant peak that goes upward. But notice on either side of the R, there's two peaks that go downwards, the Q and the S. Now if we look at the Q, we have this initial deflection downwards. So right here where my mouse is, this is right where that deflection starts to go down into the Q peak. Okay? The PR interval is from the initiation of the P wave to that initial deflection, not at the Q, but at the initial deflection downward. Okay? Then we have in purple the ST segment. The ST segment starts at the final QRS deflection. So once this S deflects back upward, right at the end of the QRS, that's the start of the ST segment. Then the end of the ST segment is basically right where the T wave starts. Sometimes where the T wave starts can be a little bit ambiguous, so ST segment can be a little bit difficult to estimate, but it's from the end of the QRS right at the end of the S deflection upward, uh, to the start of the T wave. Then we have the PR segment. The PR segment is smaller than the PR interval. And actually the PR segment and ST segments are both smaller and you can remember that because S is for smaller, segment smaller. The PR interval is from the completion of the P wave, so where the P wave ends, all the way to that initial QRS deflection. So the PR segment and PR interval actually both end at the same place right where this starts deflecting downward to Q. Okay, that's where the PR segment ends, and it starts at the end of that P wave. So that's your PR segment. What you should also notice is that if we take the time of the PR segment and add on the total time of the P wave, then that equals the PR interval. And then there's the QT interval. The QT interval also starts right here at this initial QRS deflection downward. So not at the Q, but right where it's starting to deflect downward. That's where the QT interval starts, and then ends at the very end of the T wave, where the T wave comes back down. So this in blue here, this is the QT interval. Again, if you look at the time of the QRS complex, plus the time of the ST segment, plus the time of the T wave, that in total is going to be the QT interval. Now knowing about these intervals and segments is good and all, but it doesn't do us any real good unless we can actually apply it. So to do that, let's actually do a practice problem. So we actually have a piece here that's blown up of this EKG at the top, and we're going to determine some of these values. 
So first, let's do the PR interval. Remember the PR interval starts at the initiation of the P wave and goes to right where we start deflecting downward to the Q. So right there is about where I would terminate this as the PR interval. So that green bar right there, that to me looks pretty accurate. Now also remember that each small box, and I know it's a little bit blurry here, but each small box is worth 0.04 seconds. So all I do is I count the number of boxes and multiply by 0.04, and that gets me my time. So if I start right here, here's one box, two boxes, three, and then right where uh, this starts deflecting downward, that's about halfway to the next box. So we're gonna say that this is three and a half boxes. So I'm going to take three and a half boxes times 0 0.04 seconds per box, and I get a time of 0 0.14 seconds. That is my PR interval. Now, the thing we really need to do is check to see if that's normal. So I need to know the normal ranges here for each of these. Now, depending on your source, you might see a little bit of variation here, uh, but the normal range we have here for the PR interval is between 0.12 and 0 0.20 seconds. 0.14 is right within that, a little bit on the lower side of the range, but it's still within the normal range. So this would be a normal PR interval. Next, we'll do the QRS complex itself. The QRS complex has a range where it basically has to be less than or equal to 0 0.10. Um, sometimes you'll see 0.06 to 0 0.10, but as long as it's within that range, it's fine. We don't want it more than 0 0.10 seconds. So let's do the same thing. Remember that the QRS complex, we measure from the initial deflection downward, so right where it starts to deflect downward here, and then we end it where it ends that deflection upward. So right here it starts deflecting downward, and there's Q. And then here's R at the top, and then here's S down here, and then from S it starts to go back up. And we'll call it right here where it's all the way back up. And so we just measure that distance. Again, we're gonna kinda of have to be a little bit rough here because of the resolution, but here's one box right here, and then there's a half a box on either side of that. So we're gonna call that two full boxes. And so 2.0, so two boxes times 0.04, gives us 0.08 seconds. So is this a normal QRS? Yes, it is, because 0.08 seconds is certainly less than 0.10 seconds. And in fact, the average value, which you don't really need to know that, um, it's just there for your information here, but it's right on the average. Okay, so this is actually a good QRS complex. The other relevant one that we're gonna measure is the QT interval. Now, what is the QT interval? Remember the QT interval, it actually has the same starting point as the QRS complex. It's right where we have this initial deflection that starts to go down, and then it ends right here at the end of the T wave where the T wave comes back down and reaches back to the isoelectric line. Okay, So again, we count the boxes. Now, I usually start here not counting the halves. I count the full boxes, and then I add on any halves on the end. So here's the first full box. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Here's a half. Here's another half, so nine plus two halves is 10 full boxes. So 10 full boxes times 0 0.04, this gives me 0 0.40 seconds. And this is actually gonna be normal for the QT interval. Again, with the QT interval, we just wanna make sure that it's less than 0.43. Some sources will give you a normal range that has a lower bound, but generally speaking, we normally are just gonna want it less than 0.43, and this is less than 0.43. So that's the basic idea about how you determine these parameters for an EKG. You first have to know what they are, and you can use this figure, which I just found on Wikipedia, uh, to really learn those well. And then you count the small boxes in that segment or interval and multiply by 0 0.04, and that gets you your time in seconds. The only other thing that you really need to do is know those normal ranges. Um, here's just some that I provided for you. Uh, again, your instructor, your textbook, or whatnot or might have slight variations on this, so always default with those. But that's the basic idea here. Hopefully this made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.